So the first time I slept in my car, I was 16 years old. I was unable to focus in school. All I could think about was how I would end my life. And I tried a couple times. I was hospitalized at 15 and again at 19. But this wasn't supposed to be my story. I grew up in upper class suburbia. I attended charity galas, competed in beauty pageants, and I always had food on the table. I had a private education, was placed in gifted programs, and was on track to attend Ivy League schools. I had some health issues as a child and took way longer than normal to stop peeing my pants, but all things considered, I was set up for success. You can totally wear diapers to Yale. I loved the theater, I won awards for my writing, and my teachers told me that someday I would win an Oscar for a movie I wrote and starred in. People told me I was special, and I believed them. But no one planned for what happened when my father left out of the blue, and my mother had a nervous breakdown and was diagnosed with PTSD. My own mind began to unravel. The designer clothes and fine dining faded away, but I barely noticed. All I could see was the gaping hole inside of a home that was no longer safe. The chaos of divorce led to neglect and sometimes abuse, and every terrible thing my parents said about each other became the new language that I spoke to myself. School wasn't safe either. I was bullied and had trouble connecting to others, probably because I was peeing my pants. <laughs> it was your classic traumatic childhood with a cherry on top of a natural genetic predisposition for mental illness, which led me to ask a question that many of us ask. Why am I even here? Suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 10 to 34. Doctors diagnosed me with everything. Depression, anxiety, ADHD, PTSD, adjustment disorder. <laughs> um, whatever their specialty was, that's what I had. It wasn't until my second suicide attempt that I was finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Now, bipolar disorder is a mental illness that can cause dramatic shifts in a person's mood, energy, and ability to think clearly. The highs and lows, known as mania and depression, differ from the typical ups and downs that most people experience. But that sounded really scary. So I decided I definitely didn't have bipolar disorder and never got help. Instead, I got a call back to be on The Bachelor and decided to pursue my real dream of being an entertainer in Los Angeles. I didn't want to believe I had a mental illness. I mean, didn't these people know what my sixth grade teacher said about me? I wasn't sick, I was special. So um, <laughs> I packed up my car with $3,000 in my bank account and drove to LA with the first feeling of hope that I had felt since I was 15. And almost immediately, I found drugs instead. Um, I'm not saying I'm the hero of this story, but in my defense, drugs in Los Angeles come with a lot of promises of opening your mind and spiritual healing, and I just wanted to be whole. So <laughs> I, um, instead, I, I didn't get actually onto The Bachelor. I spent the next two years crying myself to sleep, barely able to get out of bed long enough to get a job. But through a series of fortunate events, I found something I was actually good at, something I really liked. I became a corporate flight attendant on a private jet. Now, the most important thing you will learn on an airplane is what they say about putting your own oxygen mask on first, because this is what happens when you don't. I was on a layover and ended up having my first manic episode. Now, hypomania I was familiar with, the overspending, running off to Vegas with a Tinder date, staying up for days, not needing to sleep, but mania is a completely different story. I tried to jump in the frozen lake outside of my hotel and ended up in an emergency room convinced that Elon Musk was coming to pick me up in his spaceship and take me to Mars. Which is kind of funny, but really it was the most terrifying experience of my entire life to have the very fabric of your own reality stripped away. I lost my job, and because I was in the middle of moving when this happened, I ended up being denied for my new apartment. So I had no idea where I was going to go. My family didn't understand, and at times thought my issues with my mental health were my fault, and I was too ashamed to tell my friends. So at 23 years old, this pageant girl, private flight attendant hottie standing before you ended up homeless, like actually homeless, sleeping in my car for the second time since high school. Here I was again asking the question, why am I even here? 
I remember one day I knocked on the door of a yoga studio and asked to use the bathroom. And they said, yes, but lock the door behind you. We don't want any homeless people coming in. And I was like, yeah, gross, homeless people. <laughs> Uh, it was a good thing I was uh, wearing Lululemon yoga pants and Nikes, because otherwise they would have known that I was homeless. These are the real-life side effects of mental health stigma. I came into the world with every privilege a woman can have and was equally affected by a society that's broken by stigma. Stigma doesn't discriminate, neither does mental illness. I'm going to share with you three steps we can take to help ourselves heal and to help those struggling with mental illness. The first is radically abolishing mental health stigma. The problem is not the diagnosis. The problem is how much we hate ourselves for having a diagnosis. How afraid we are to ask for help. How slow we are to offer compassion to ourselves and to others. I could have skipped like 10 sad steps in that soliloquy had I just responded to my diagnosis with, OK, how do we manage this? A diagnosis is only a death sentence if you kill yourself. You might think having a mental illness is a personal weakness that you should be able to control without help, but this frankly isn't true. Your brain is responding to real chemical imbalances causing you to feel the way you do. Self-hatred does not have to be a side effect of mental illness as long as you can recognize that those feelings of hopelessness are not your fault. It also helps to know that you're not alone. One in five U.S. adults experience mental illness each year, and one in 25 U.S. adults experience serious mental illness each year. It helps to not define yourself by mental illness, just like you wouldn't define yourself by physical illness. People aren't cancer, they have cancer. I'm not bipolar, I'm in recovery from bipolar disorder. If you broke your bone, you wouldn't pretend it wasn't broken, you would set it straight, and friends and strangers alike would sign your cast. But when you break your mind, most people do everything they can to keep it hidden beneath the surface. Those fragile pieces you're barely holding together, tend to crumple in the secrecy, and no one's there to sign your cast. They just call you crazy. Because of this, 43.3% of US adults with mental illness received treatment in 2018. This is unacceptable. It helps to speak out against the stigma. My biggest hack for overcoming stigma is to become an advocate. Society will let you get away with anything as long as you become an advocate for it. <laughs> I now serve as a suicide prevention speaker and work as an, uh, a field advocate for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and I'm a crisis counselor for the Crisis Text Line. And yes, it's incredibly hard to fit that all in my Instagram bio, but I manage. <laughs> Mental illness is an explanation, not an excuse. I had to learn this the hard way. I was released from my Elon Musk adventure with no treatment plan, no medication, no referrals to a psychiatrist, and no safe place to go, which, in my opinion, is the craziest thing that happened here. Researchers suggest that people with bipolar disorder are between 25 to 60 percent of them will attempt suicide at least once in their life, and between 4 and 19 percent will complete suicide. Manic episodes can be just as dangerous as depressive ones. <sighs> I decided that I was not going to be a statistic. I'm really grateful that that was how my situation played out, because I was pushed off a cliff, and in the free fall, I made the choice that I was going to get better, and most importantly, I was going to love myself, even if I did not. So self-care became my full-time job. The second step we can take is to understand what self-care means for you. The self-care industry is a $10 billion industry, but what is self-care? Is it Zumba, a vegan diet, face masks? I hope. <laughs> but self-care is, I think, just as misunderstood as mental health is. You see, self-care can be when you fling your body out of your bed, tangled in sheets, and you elbow crawl your way to the kitchen to get mac and cheese, and then back to bed to watch Netflix. Self-care can be taking your contacts out at night, deleting an ex's number, or volunteering to take care of someone. And sometimes self-care is asking for someone to take care of you. Self-care is having the compassion to ask yourself what you need. I mean, really need, and the compassion to answer that request. And only you can know what that looks like for you. For myself, when I realized there was no knight in shining armor or person with a rose coming to balance my brain chemistry, I immediately stopped all recreational drug use. It's important to differentiate between drugs and medicine. 
Just because a hippie calls a drug medicine doesn't mean it is for you. And just because a doctor calls a drug medicine, unfortunately, doesn't always mean it is for you. I learned this the hard way because I was prescribed Adderall, and Adderall can be very dangerous for people with bipolar disorder. So I chose to let all of that go. Now, <laughs> I have a very dramatic and very scientific theory that dehydration is self-conscious self-harm. Because if you think about it, the two things that connect us first to life are our breath and water. So the next time you're thinking about maybe wanting to end your life or even having an anxiety attack, maybe drink a glass of water first. My self-care might sound silly to others, and that's fine. The only person who has to understand how you take care of yourself is you. Now, climbing out of a, uh, out of a ravine can be harder than falling into it. I spent months at urgent care, standing in line for medication. I had to battle with my insurance to qualify for even the most basic medical care, and it took me months to be seen by a psychiatrist. I had to question every thought I had, trying to grasp onto any sense of reality, and I ended up sleeping on the floor of my pageant coach's office until basically an acquaintance allowed me to come stay in their guest room. I remember there was one night when I was still having suicidal thoughts and I drove myself back to the emergency room, which was kind of like a dramatic running through the airport grand gesture of self-love and retrospect, and I'm really grateful for that. I calmed my own mind with kind words, I held my own hand, I ended up realizing that the person whose love I was waiting for was my own. The third step that we can take is to take radical responsibility for our emotions. I actively try <laughs> not to blame others for my sadness or my joy. I am the curator of my emotional experience, and it's a masterpiece. I do not judge myself for any of my emotions. They're all welcome. Every feeling needs a home, and that shelter is within me. As an artist, every emotion becomes another color on the easel that I use to communicate my experience and my story. It is possible to have flourishing relationships, blossoming creativity, and a stable income, even with a serious mental illness. It requires understanding, and I can't expect others to understand me until I first understand myself. I've learned that the way that we help ourselves, the way we calm this, this, this tropical storm inside of our own minds is through our voice, and it's through my experiences with mental illness that I found mine. I've also learned that it's not my privilege or my disability that's going to take me where I'm going to go. I'm flying the plane now. I'm deciding who I'm going to be, where I'm going, one decision at a time. I asked myself a hundred times, why am I even here? I remember I was in the hospital and I painted this picture of a girl and it was me. <laughs> and I painted underneath it, I am my own why. We are each our own why. The person who's coming to save you, congratulations, it's you. There is help, there's so many resources available, but the only person who can ask for it is you. So it turns out that I actually am special. <laughs> But it's not because of what the world sees in me, it's because of how I choose to see myself. So why am I even here? I am why. Thank you.